All right, designers, we are finished, hoorah, with the elements and principles of design, and we're moving on to ideation, which is a fancy word for the making of ideas, how we formulate ideas, how we come up with that one big idea to um, around which we center our designs. Because remember, we're dealing with um, a message as designers, a message that we are going to communicate in as engaging a way as possible. So the message is all important. So in a lot of ways, today is a great time to be a designer. We have what seems like unlimited resources, including instant access to vast image databases like Getty Images or Shutterstock and online search sites, which same thing. Um, the trade-off, I would say, is that the landscape of contemporary graphic design could be looked at as being uh, mired in mediocre design solutions because we, we tend to want to capitalize on convenience. Because we can do things fast, we do do things fast, and fast isn't always, um, doesn't always create the best product, is I guess a way to say it. Sometimes we wind up with some dull designs, and I'm not saying any of these designs that I have on the screen right now are dull designs. Um, I'm just showing you the, um, you, know, just, you just Google anything with design, you're gonna get you know, millions of pages of stuff. Um, yeah, a dull design can still be slick and eye-catching, but it might also be instantly dispensable. Once it does its job, you, no one's ever gonna look at it again, no one's gonna wanna reuse it, you're gonna be bored with it. Um, there's not much to it, and you have an opportunity to make a statement. The temptation today with all these resources in our fancy creative clouds and um, um, Adobe software is to turn immediately or very quickly to the computer and skip the idea phase of design. Um, it's like skipping the planning part of a house and just starting to build it. You the architect and the engineers think through a lot of elements before they've, they spend too much time. Because sometimes you can pick something quickly and spend a lot of time uh, executing it and then to only look at it towards the end and be like, oh, that's, that's not all that interesting, is it? Um, so spend the time up front. So today, instead of this, we settle for the first idea that comes to us. Um, we start to build it up prematurely, like I was saying, without any exploring or really experimenting. So this is a tool, form storming is a tool that can help you to explore and experiment in order to come up with the best design solutions. Form storming exercises are designed to trigger and tease out options and ideas that go beyond the obvious, beyond the familiar. They help prompt us as designers to find fresh ways to illuminate whatever subject we're working on. So let's say this is a, a form storming exercise that um, someone did. Uh, it's from um, our, our, we don't, if we had a textbook, this would be the book. Um, so the client here is the Egg Farmers of America. Okay, they're our client. We want to come up with a new ad campaign. So, you know, we all know what eggs are, um, but how do we start? How do we start kind of just saying like, you know, what are, you know, what are eggs? What are some ideas? Like, how do we, how do we, rather than eggs are good, eggs are good for us. Um, we want to we want to think big and we want to think beyond the obvious. Um, so this form storming exercise is to visually interpret um, egg eggness the word egg in as many ways possible. And this designer set out to do it in a hundred different ways. So they found a hundred different ways to say egg. And this is what um, twelve of them, ten of them. You can see. Uh, and the point of this is not to censor yourself. It's not to kind of say, well, I did reproductive eggs. You know, they, they, the client would never go for that. That's not, that's not the, this is not the time for that. There's plenty of time to go back and um, intellectualize things. But this, that's not the point of this. This is to free your mind. There are no wrong ideas. When it comes to thumbnails and, and form storming and brainstorming, there are no wrong ideas. So how did this designer expand her thinking to include an image of Benedict Arnold, which is really funny. Um, that was an association she made. She, she probably sat there with her pen and paper, like you're going to be doing, and she just egg, eggs Benedict. Oh, Benedict, Benedict Arnold. She, she came up with that, and she put it down. And, and who knows? That, that, 
I, I don't know what if anything ever came of this, but that would be a really funny ad campaign. I mean, it, it could be it could be very interesting. So sometimes the the most interesting stuff seems crazy when you first come comes across your mind, but um, often it's not. How did you get the goose? How did you get Humpty Dumpty? A, a chair from those chairs were I think like in the '60s. Those chairs were I don't know what they're called. Probably an egg chair. So. One of the things she helped um, that she did to help herself with her form storming exercise was to employ semiotics. And now semiotics is a, it's another fancy word, but it's a tool to help us better visually communicate. Um, and I have, what do you know, a nice little video that I think sums it up quite well. Uh, let's look at that and then I'll pick up with you in a few minutes. All right. This blob is eating dinner. This blob is sleepy. This blob loves you. But how do we know that? This is a job for semiotics, the field of study that explores how humans and other organisms derive meaning from the world around them. In semiotics, a sign is anything that represents or indicates something else, called the object. A sign isn't necessarily pictorial. For example, the feel of a fruit may indicate its ripeness, and the sound of buzzing may mean there is a bee around. Charles Sanders Peirce defined three categories of sign, icon, index, and symbol, based on how the sign is related to the object. An icon directly resembles the object. It shares tangible qualities with the object. For example, a painting of a pipe is an icon representing a pipe. A map of London is an icon representing London. And the sound of coconuts may be an icon representing the sound of horses' hooves in a film. An index has an implied association with the object. The sign and the object are connected in a logical way. For example, a growling stomach indicates hunger, sunglasses and a white cane indicate blindness, and the smell of smoke indicates a nearby fire. A symbol is not inherently connected to the object. Instead, the connection is a matter of convention within a particular society. Because their meanings must be explicitly taught, symbols are easily misunderstood. Examples of symbols include the dotted lines on a road, symbolizing that drivers may pass one another, and the Star of David, symbolizing Judaism. Most words are also symbols, as they have no natural connection with the objects they represent. Professionals in any field that involves interaction and communication can benefit from understanding semiotics. For example, user interface designers are charged with making websites, programs, and applications easy to navigate, and they often utilize icons, indices, and symbols to achieve that goal. In order to create an effective interface, Designers may run side-by-side -side tests, called A-B testing, to determine which signs are best associated with the intended object. The public's interpretation of signs changes very quickly in the realm of technology, as evidenced by the highly debated use of the hamburger button to represent a menu. Through widespread use of the button and careful design choices surrounding it, the hamburger button is now correctly interpreted by most users and has quickly become an industry standard. Similarly, signs may become less attached to their meaning over time, such as the image of a floppy disk representing the save function. Formerly an index, as users associated a physical floppy disk with storing information, this button has become a symbol as new users learn its function without ever having experience with a floppy disk. Animators and illustrators also need semiotics to understand how their work will be interpreted by audiences. While some depictions of emotions are based on natural and universal facial expressions, others are symbolic and only make sense to certain audiences. This became clear when emoji, originally developed for a Japanese phone messaging service, were introduced to the West. This new audience used their own experiences with Western comics and cartoons to interpret emoji, often in ways the original designers had not intended. For example, in Western animation, an angry character may blow steam from their nose or ears, so Western audiences interpret this emoji as angry, while the original intention was to depict a person exhaling in triumph after accomplishing a goal. Understanding how different cultures view certain symbols is of utmost importance in today's world of global media. These examples may imply that semiotics focuses only on human interactions with the man-made world, but in fact, biologists use semiotics to understand how all life forms interact with and interpret their environment. The ability to express and interpret signs, however rudimentary, is one of the fundamental qualities that distinguishes living organisms from non-living objects. Furthermore, the ability to interpret abstract, symbolic signs seems to be unique to human beings and may help to distinguish humans from non-human animals. Whether you're a fish looking for food or a student looking for the library, interpreting signs is an essential part of everyday life. Knowing more about how we make meaning from the world around us will help us to be better communicators and creators.
All right, how about that? I thought that was really good. I did not have that for uh, my last two semesters, and I found that on YouTube, and I thought it was um, short and to the point. So, to of course, I will reiterate it now and spend more time. Semiotics divides uh, signs, or all things that represent meaning, into two categories, the signified and the signifier. The signifier is the symbol. In this case, my example here, these, uh, and signified is the actual thing. So we're talking about a restroom, and the signifier is the symbol. It can be a symbol, it can be an index, it can be an icon. In this case, it's a symbol. So when I say signified, it's the thing. Signifier is the, um, the um, symbol or icon or index. So first one, uh, go over quickly, um, can be one of three, as the video told you. Uh, icons are a direct representation. Anything with a physical resemblance to the signified would be considered an icon. This is pretty close. A symbol is the opposite of an icon, and that it does not resemble the signifier being represented. They're abstract representations based on agreement or culture or, or convention or culture. For example, the center, that might be a symbol for Ireland. It could be a symbol for luck. Um, the one on the left could be a symbol for ideas. It could be for innovation. Um, but it's not a picture of innovation. It's not a picture of luck. Of course, in those two examples, you can't really have a picture of them, which is one of the reasons we have symbols. How do I capture the idea of that in a visual form? How do you create, how do you capture the idea of luck in a visual form since it's not a, an actual thing? You use a symbol. Words are considered symbols as she described to you. Index are indirect to the subject. They point to uh, or are a physical mark left by the object. Smoke for fire, a fingerprint for a hand. Um, here's ones for eggs. And by the way, indexical are often considered the most interesting of the three because it takes, you have to take, the viewer has to take a conceptual leap in their mind to, to make the connections. It's not as obvious. You're not just showing them an egg. Um, and, and, and by doing that, you involve the viewer or the reader more in the process. They're actively involved in the process. They'll have to look at it and go, and they'll have to create a narrative like, okay, chicken, egg carton, and figure out what the connection is. It's a little bit of a puzzle. So here's an example for heart. An icon is an actual literal looking heart. The symbol is what we've come to associate with Valentine's Day, and indexical is someone having a heart attack. So semiotics help us expand our scope of thinking and representation. By repeatedly tapping into our mental database of associations and ideas, we're able to exhaust, emphasis on exhaust the obvious, and get to the fresher territory. You get through all those obvious things, and you just, and it's, it's not the easiest thing, and then semesters pass with the exercise you're going to be doing, the students struggle with it because I think they want it to be done in five minutes and move on to the next thing. But it, it is, it's hard, it's hard work to kind of keep going back to the drawing board. That's what we do as designers. So form storming is considered a lateral form of thinking because it, invo it involves indirect exploration, indirect, as opposed to a more linear reasoning. So later, lateral and linear are the two different kinds. Uh, linear would be more analytic, more like, well, what's the client want? What do the what do the markets say? What do the um, surveys we've done? What do they tell us? And those are all valid, and those have to be included when you work on some large campaign, say. But this is before that. This is just to get your ideas going. The emphasis is on indirect creative forms of research. <clears throat> and as Malcolm Greer says here, a problem worthy of the name of a problem is seldom accessible to sudden and simple solutions. Oh, this is, by the way, uh, another student from, I believe it's in MICA, and those are the students that are featured in um, our textbook. Um, they found 100 diverse and graphically compelling images to represent the letter A. Pretty cool. You won't be doing that. All right. Another method, a lateral uh, way of doing things, is brainstorming, which you probably are more familiar with. I, I would say the difference is um, brainstorming is a little bit more written um, than it is 
um, image-based like Formstorming is. So they kind of go hand in hand. It depends on the client, but you can use either one of them um, and often use them together. But it has the same goal of repeatedly tapping into your mental database of association and ideas. So here's one. Uh, you're, I'll show you this sample in a second. Let me see. Okay, I, I have these in the wrong order. So in this example, um, it's for the, uh, it's a logo design, it's the creative briefs for a Folklore Museum logo. That's the name of the organization, it's the Folklore Museum. Um, there's lateral thinking and linear thinking, and the two are not mutually exclusive, like I just mentioned in the last slide. Um, if you're doing some kind of larger campaign, you, you need all the details and the and what the survey say and what the client wants. That's all very important as well. You have to rationally think through it, but that's that's not what we're doing right now. Right now, we are thinking more, we want you to think, um, when I say laterally, it's like in all directions, as opposed to linear in one direction. Um, so we're gonna begin by thinking laterally uh, and brainstorm as many ideas as, as possible in order to generate ideas. So this is what the person did, um, the sample in the book. They would, and they, they would have handwritten, Took the two words of the museum, wrote down folklore, and started brainstorming. Magic. Okay, after I think of magic, then I'm going to write down wand and saucer. Oh, what else can folklore be? Oh, princess. Prince or princess. Okay, oh, that thing make me think of crowns. It makes me think of castles. Hmm, what else? Oh, good and evil. So it's just this process where you keep going back to the word and just anything that comes to mind. Anything that comes to mind. Um, it could be the name of it. Could be a television show. It could be a character. It could be, you know, dragons. It could be Felici. It could be, you know, whatever. Um, they do the same thing with museum. Museum, not as interesting a word uh, as folklore, but still, you get the idea. So I'm going to go back to my previous one. I went ahead and did this to show you what yours might look like. Now you're not doing the folklore museum. You're going to do something different. But I wrote down folklore, and I did this pretty fast. But you can see which Salem, Halloween, Cauldron, Frog, and then I, you know, you can draw little things if you want to. Uh, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones. I forgot. I don't know what that says. Demons, Cult and Compass, Dwarf, Elf, Ogre, Troll, Creatures, Billy Goat, Gruff, uh, Bremen Animals, Magic Animals, Frog, Unicorn. I just went on and on, and it, it's it's a. Um, a web, you know, you write one thing and then you get to, you get to, to wizards, and then from that, Harry Potter comes off of that, and J.K. Rowling and Ron Hermione, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then what you would want to do, um, so you state you state the problem in the center of the page, which I didn't exactly do. I just wrote the name of it, um, and you have these outward spokes, and each. The, the two sections of the logo are considered separately. They don't have to be, you don't have to match every word, but there's only two words. Um, and your your final your final logo might not have an image or anything of the museum, it might just be the word museum, but at least you've explored it. So the next step after the initial idea brainstorm session is the visual. And I'm, I'm going to go into this in more detail um, in class uh, where we're going to be working on an exercise much like that last one. But what I want to get to is when you, uh, the, the, the visual part, when you start, when you start on that, you'll, you'll have narrowed down your ideas from your initial brainstorming. You'll say, okay, I think I'm going to approach, um, I'm going to go with the castle kind of thing and maybe a big M for the museum, whatever. Uh, and then you'll start drawing. And we refer to um, a small, quick, rapidly drawn stamp size composition as a thumbnail. It's called a thumbnail because originally they thought of it as being about as small as a thumbnail. I'm not asking you to make your things as small as a thumbnail. It's completely unnecessary. My thumbnails are actually rather large. But the point is that they should be, as you see here, loose and expressive. I want you to try many variations. They should be spontaneous and prolific, meaning you should do a lot of them. Um, they are a recorded thought process of developing ideas and they should move as rapidly as you think. Don't stop and worry about what color your king is wearing on his, you know, in his uh, cloak or what the, the crown is made out of or if the dragon has wings or not have wings. Just get the idea of dragon down and move on to the next thing because it's, it's, it's an exercise. Um, don't worry about the detail. So, this is the exercise, the example from our book, and these are three final logos that were um, brought about by the brainstorming, formstorming that were done uh, from oops, from that. Okay, uh, it was an actual real project done with a class.
So we're not doing finished logos with this project, but we're gonna do some just up to the thumbnail phase. This is the final execution phase, which you'll be doing in a later project, but not this first one. Um, okay, so once we get now, let me see, go back to thumbnails. Those are thumbnails, those are, those are rough, those are good. Um, the, thumb, the, the main point is for you to know what's going on. Um, if it's part of a project where you need to have a teacher or someone to weigh in on them, it's good if uh, that person can also understand them. Of course, you can just explain it to them, but it's really for you. Um, so thumbnail. The next step after thumbnail, I would call a rough. Now this one in color, the second one, the one in the middle, I would call that a rough of the thumbnail on the left. So um, the student did the thumbnail on the left and then she and I spoke and we both liked the idea, but she wanted to delve uh, further into it. So that's where she came up with this more finished look um, for the original thumbnail. The one on the right is one of her other ideas. I mean, once you start putting color into it, it's, you're getting into the roughs and not the thumbnail territory. Once again, it's it's fast, and and I think you'll experience this when we work on the project next class. Uh, a lot of students struggle with this because they kind of want to get with the first idea, and they'll they quote run out of ideas and quote very quickly. Um, it's it's pretty challenging. Here is some more of her. This are her very initial thumbnails. Just a simple line. It aims to push the achievable boundaries. You, it allows for maximum flexibility and fluidity. You're not worrying about opening a document in Photoshop or Illustrator or where your fonts are coming from or if your computer's working. It's just you and your ideas. You can produce as many ideas as you can sketch. You can explore the various components in as much depth as possible and quickly. You'll quickly weed out bad ideas. You'll draw them and, and five minutes later you're like, oh my God, that's the worst idea. Now, if you had jumped on the computer and started to design it and then decided it was a, a crappy idea after you spent two hours on it, that, that's, that's a waste. Here's actual thumbnails from what will be your final project, your, your fourth project um, that a student did. And these are also pretty tight. These are thumbnails that I did for when I, um, come up with concepts for the theater. Um, I know I'm gonna do a photo shoot with actors, so I just wanna figure out what positions they need to be in before I do the photo shoot. Um, and it, once again, do not bypass this process. It really is important. It can inhibit the development of ideas because you restrict yourself um, to only what you see, what someone else has done that you might find online and not what's in your own brain. I call this one on the left a rough. I drew that before um, I ever did the design on the right, but the director wanted to see the idea and so did the theater. And so it's, you can see it stayed pretty close to the, I mean, the final. So the generation of ideas is the focus, not the drawing unto itself. I mean, I can draw a lot better than that picture there, uh, but what's the point? It's not, it's, it's not a cartooning class. It's, it's a graphic design class. That's more of a rough, that's just tighter for no particular reason. Probably because it was harder and I decided to make it as finished as possible. Okay, so once you have a number of ideas sketched out, you can then step back and make judgments. Then you start editing. Then you read what the client wrote and what your boss wrote and what the market survey say and you and then you compare it to how you brainstorm and you say oh yeah i think that could work oh yeah well that would definitely not work that's crazy or that's when you start um editing yourself prior to this do not edit yourself so i think and that is the last slide for this uh sermon on um ideation uh and brainstorming this is fun to me this is why i like designing um, and I hope that you will find the fun in that too. Um, cause like I said, there's not a lot of right or wrong answers at this point. So, okay, do the quiz. We'll continue talking about this in class and we'll do an in-class exercise, which is a lot like the folklore museum. We'll be doing a rock and roll museum. Um, see how creatively I change that. Uh, and that's it. So I will chat with you all later. Bye.